midnight on the Atlantic. Four hours after launch, over four miles of cable have played out without a hitch. Fifteen thousand eight hundred feet down, the new ROV, Ocean Discovery, is closing in on what should be Target 71, Liberty Bell. should be from your heading down to the right. It's been 38 years since Jim Lewis last saw Gus Grissom's spaceship. It's been two months since Kurt Newport found it. I got it dead ahead at about 15 not over. At the coordinates for Target 71, nothing appears on the screen. Right, it's northeast of Target 71. Oh, but not northeast of this position. No, negative. Northeast of Target 71. Okay, so it's southeast of here. Roger that. While well, satellite signals enable the searchers to pinpoint their surface position, the location of the ROV is less precise. Drift due to underwater currents and the miles of cable that link the submersible to the mothership add an element of guesswork to calculating Liberty Bell's exact location. And so what we're doing now is we've recalculated, taken the raw position of the uh, side scan data, applied the offset and applied our layback, which was considerable, 7,000 meters and we're moving in a direction that's northeast of our projected target of target 71, the one that we originally had put in. And we're doing it in small increments of 100 meters at a time. Dazed and confused. Yeah. Dazed and confused. I want to, you know, if we're not going to come up with this for a little while, I'd like to jump another 75 meters west. They scour the bottom for 48 hours. But the capsule remains lost from sight. The correct 71 position, I think, was this one right here. Then you go south, basically, 75 meters, 80 meters, and then start heading back east to this yeah. point. Let's try that program. Go 100 meters, track along 100 meters, make a search in that area, in the corner, come down south, as you say, 75 to 80 meters, make a search in that area, and then track to the east. The best targets were at the original launch point, so if we work our way back that way, we may see some other things we didn't see this morning. Give it a shot. Let's do it to it. Okay. I don't understand how we could be on this thing and take a fix and go down there and search as much as we've been searching and not find it. That's what I don't understand. We have the coordinates of the DGPS fix he took when we were diving on the spacecraft, and we've been there, and it's not there. That's what I don't understand. It's a very, as Steve was saying, it's a very simple thing to do. But you have to go, I mean, to me, you have to go by what we've seen. We've been down there, we've driven around, and it's not there. We're on our third day here, and we have found nothing. And I'm open to any possibilities at this point in time. The search for Target 71 creeps slowly, 600 meters to the north. But after five days at sea, the mission 
is running on borrowed time. On his next trip to space, Gus Grissom tackled the legacy of Liberty Bell head on. He nicknamed his new spacecraft the unsinkable Molly Brown. But only after NASA vetoed calling it the Titanic. Despite the hatch incident, NASA entrusted Grissom with command of the first mission in Project Gemini. I guess he felt like he was a forgotten man when he was in between Shepard and Glenn. No one ever talked about Gus. And so Gus said, I think I can make a name for myself with Gemini. Grissom's partner for the trailblazing two-man flight was Navy pilot John Young. Young was part of a growing core of rookie astronauts that included Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan, destined to be the first and last men to walk on the moon. I was just a young naval aviator, which thrust into a, uh, into a cadre, a group of guys, probably most competitive human beings in the entire world. Found myself walking the, uh, walking the halls with the likes of uh, Al Shepard, John Glenn, Wallace Shaw, Gus Grissom, Slate, and the others. And uh, sometimes I, I had to ask myself what I was doing here among these guys. Gus was always sort of aloof. It was almost as if Gus didn't have time for the new kids on a block. Gus was too busy heading back into space. Four years after Liberty Bell 7, Gus Grissom prepared to make history again as the first man to visit space twice. 9.24 a.m. The first of 10 Gemini missions headed for orbit. Gene Cernan remembers his first blast off in Gemini. The first stage lasted two and a half minutes or so. And that's when the revelation of, uh, of the fact that you were riding on a rocket really came home to me because we were pushed back in our seats maybe four, four and a half times uh, uh, the weight of gravity. So it was hard even to lift your hands off your chest to get to the controls. And then at first stage, shut down. I mean, it was just roaring and, and you felt like, here you go and you're just going to blast out into the universe somewhere. 90 minutes into the flight, Gus took a critical step on the road to the moon. Firing Molly Brown's thrusters, he eased into a different orbit. For the first time ever, a space traveler had changed course, proving that man could navigate on this new ocean. While Project Mercury tested man's ability to survive in space, Gemini was about learning to fly, developing the skills needed to go to the moon. Grissom's pinpoint orbital maneuvers set the stage for later flights, missions that would perfect rendezvous and docking techniques, and extravehicular activities, like Ed White's historic spacewalk during Gemini 4. After splashdown, Gus was determined to prevent a repeat of the hatch incident. Molly Brown stayed locked tight, even when six-foot waves made the test pilot lose his lunch. The flawless mission at last confirmed Grissom's status as an American hero. Now Gus set his sights on the moon and command of a spaceship called Apollo 1. <laughs>